And um, we have always started these sessions by just kind of going around and asking how folks are doing. And uh, I'll kind of call your name. And uh, um, I really don't want to, we've got a lot of folks on right now. But I don't want to miss out on that either. I think it's kind of important. So if you guys don't mind, uh, I'll call your name and uh, the uh, and just just a quick. We don't have a lot of time, but just a quick sentence about how you're doing, how you're holding up. So Dave Fuji, I'll let you go first. Yeah, am I coming through okay? You're coming through great. Cool. Yeah, things are going great here. Um, took a really long nap, which was uh, nicely, nicely done and uh, very much needed. Good, good. Ken Tromberg, how about you? Uh, doing pretty good. I wish I would have taken a nap today. I think I could use it. Yeah, so but, do I. Uh, looking, looking forward to uh, seeing what we've got here. Great. Yeah, I uh, had the choice between going out taking some photographs or taking a nap. Now I'm questioning my choice. Uh, Bill Snively, how about you? Are you there, Bill? Mm, Bill, I'm afraid we can't hear you. Uh, Kathy Hibbard, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Maybe your other person needs to push a space bar to unmute. That's true. It actually shows me on my screen whether or not they're muted and they're not muted. Oh. Yeah. So, um, no, sorry. Go ahead, Kathy. How, how, how's life treating you? Um, life is treating me great. Okay. <laughs> um, Steve Fogdahl. Doing fine. <clears throat> Bonnie and I got out and took some more photos. Okay. Uh, Ra, I hope. Yes. I asked you that question last week. Is there any photograph you want to, you know, we might finish this photo today. Do you want to share yours for next week? Uh, that makes me nervous. Oh, you should try doing a Lightroom Photoshop session sometime. Um, it's fine if you don't want to, Steve, but I'd be, uh, I'd be happy if you would. So just like, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Uh, okay. Wes, Wesley Doug Douglas. Hi, I'm doing well. Okay, great. Um, the names are jumping all over my screen. So if I miss you, I'm sorry. Or if I call you twice, I'm sorry. Um, Derek Ford. Derek, you're muted. Randy. Hi, Brian. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, you doing all right? I'm, I'm, I'm doing fine. Okay. Uh, Jeff Manser, did we ask, did I ask you already? Uh, you didn't, but I'm doing fine, and I echo the sentiment of uh, thanks for doing this. Much appreciated. Oh, my pleasure. Um, Ken Tromberg, did I ask you already? Uh, yes, you did. Okay. Yeah, I thought I did. And then, uh, Laura, you there? Laura says she's good. She's not going to unmute. She's downstairs. Laura's my wife. Uh, Matthew Schuler. I'm fine here. Okay, great. And Randy Hibbard? Randy, that's you. I'm doing fine, thanks. <laughs> okay. Randy is my dad. Randy is the mayor of Weezer. He's got his hands full right now. So, uh, Russell Wilcock. I'm uh, doing well, just been doing some spring cleaning. Ah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have plenty of time on my hands. <laughs> I feel for you. Yep. Uh, Shane Davila. Doing great, man. Hey, good. Yes, Brian. Really do. What's that? Sorry. I yeah, really appreciate you doing this. Yeah. This hey. Um. I know. I know that you can do Photoshop, so I might put you on the spot. We'll see. Um. Because I've seen your I'm pictures on Facebook. Guy. You've it's you've got bad. some some I magic of your own. Photoshop. What's that? I, I'm more of a Lightroom I, guy and don't really know a lot about Photoshop. Oh, okay. Good to know. And uh, Shane Langdon. 
I'm doing good over here. Uh, thanks for the invite for this. I'm excited about it. You bet. I've got my chat window up. Um, as I am going through things, if you look at the Zoom bar, um, there is a chat window and I will try to try to respond to chat messages as well. So as I'm talking, if you have a question, don't feel, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, but I would just ask you to stay muted otherwise. Um, Darren Havlinka, uh, Darren, I should be able to say your last name. Havlinka, are you there? Okay, moving on. It does, I don't see Darren's microphone, so I don't. And then Lindy Helvey and Patricia Sharp, um, neither of them have microphones and Patricia raised on the chat window. So um, hopefully you guys are doing okay. Uh, did I miss anybody? All right, hearing none. Uh, just a couple of uh, um, housekeeping items. Uh, so Steve Fogdahl, you emailed me another really good question last week and I proceeded not to email you back, which is really bad on my part. Um, but your question, I did not know this. Apparently there are two different Lightroom packages. One package is Lightroom along with a terabyte of disk space, and that is $10 a month. And the other one is Lightroom and Photoshop, but without a terabyte of disk space. And that is uh, uh, $10 a month as well. And you were asking which one I recommend. Um, I'm kind of, I'd be inclined. Did I get that right, St uh, Steve? Yes. Okay. I would be inclined. The setup I have is Lightroom and Photoshop, and uh, and I use I use other means of backing up my photos. Um, I actually have disk because my photos are so large; they're well over a terabyte in size, and so I back them up onto portable disks and then put the portable disks in alternate locations, um, so that if we have a house fire or something like that, I don't lose my photos. Um, Patricia Sharp, I see you, the screen, and others signed on, no sound. Um, I assume everybody else is hearing me okay? I'm not hearing anybody say otherwise. Yes. I yes, okay. All right. Good. Um, I'm trying to figure out uh how to respond to patty um yeah yeah that's a fair point Sorry, guys. I'm all right. Let's uh, let's uh, do that. Okay, and Bill Snively just figured out his audio. Excellent. Um, I hope we don't go over twenty people because man, <laughs> we might uh, we might have issues. Um, Steve, my recommendation, but I kind of wanted to save it for the group to see if anybody else had. Uh, any thoughts on it? My recommendation would be to get Photoshop and Lightroom. Um, you might, Lightroom I think is pretty intuitive and it's definitely the place to start. But um, if you don't have the pixel editing capabilities that only Photoshop gives you, you, you might find yourself in a place where later on where you regret having that. That would be my concern. Um, that being said, for a very long time, I did 100% of my photo mm -hmm. editing in Lightroom. And um, I'm wondering, so Steve, you would kind of characterize yourself as you're not a beginner photographer because you've done a lot of photography before, but maybe a, um, would it be accurate to say kind of a beginner in the digital space, the post-processing space and so forth, using tools like Lightroom and stuff? Is that correct? Yes. 
Yeah, so my recommendation would be to go Lightroom and Photoshop, but, um, you know, and figure out another solution for backups. I'm, I'm wondering if anybody else has any other input on this. Am I steering Steve in completely the wrong direction? Well, uh, uh, this is Russ. I, I use Lightroom and Photoshop myself, and I have alternate me uh, means of backup as well. Uh, the uh, raw images that I'm taking are, you know, like 55, 60 mega piece. So uploading those to uh, cloud storage uh, can be really, really slow, depending on your up speed uh, that you have at home. Mm -hmm. So uh, unless you have some pretty fast up speed, you're going to be spending a lot of time uploading your photos to that terabyte of space. Yeah, that's a really good point, Russ, because like if you look at our internet connection, it's it, we have a slow internet connection because it's over a wireless connection, but it's 12 megabits down and four megabits up. And uh, most internet connections are like that. It's really slow uploading, but really fast downloading. And so if you've got these huge raw files, um, it's going to be pretty slow going. Any other input? Ryan, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Is that Dave? No, this is Bill. Bill Snyder. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Um, one thing that I might suggest that uh, without getting too geeky for some people is a network network attached storage unit, uh, which often are referred to as NAS or NAS units. And uh, those things, uh, you can have multiple hard drives, have failovers, um, you know, it, it doesn't tend itself very well to a wireless environment, but to a wired environment, um, it, it works out really good. I mean, I've got terabytes of things that are stored on our NAS, and in case of evacuation, I just unplug two cords and take it with me. Yeah, well, that's a great idea. Um, and Bill, you are a race car driver, so do you ever get NAS and NOS? Is it NOS? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, do you ever put your disk drive in your car expecting your car to go faster? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways I've expected my car to go faster, but that's not one of them. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Terrible jokes. Um, so I heard somebody about to say something in there. Yeah, this is Daniel. I also use a NAS, and it has indeed capabilities to work over the network, internal network, but also... Uh, have capabilities like uh, mimic a cloud. So you could use, you can load your your photos in a NAS and you can upload them and then you can share them, for example, with customers or with yourself uh, by applications that you can load in your phone or to other computers. Okay. Okay. That's right. So you can access your NAS. Now I want to call it the NAS, sorry. Um, you can access the NAS over your phone and so forth as well. That's right. Um, the key thing that I think you would need to worry about is, as Bill said, making sure that if you do have a situation, we live up in Wilderness Ranch, which has a fire danger, uh, Bill and I both do, and uh, just being able to grab it and go is really important. Um, so, yeah. All right, I'm going to move us on from this. I've got, uh, uh, so Bill, um, you, uh, emailed me right before uh, the call and I wanted to, whoa, it just happened. I'm on the wrong computer. Um, here we go. Bill, you emailed me right before, can you guys still see my screen okay? Yes. It was beautiful Ansel Adams print. Um, I mentioned this Ansel Adams print during our first session a couple of weeks ago. Um, everybody, uh, put a towel underneath their jaw, or if you've got a microphone or whatever, because you're about to start drooling. Um, this is a contact print that is on Bill Snidely's wall at his house. And it is a contact print of, a, uh, of an Ansel Adams photograph. Um, and so uh, I mentioned that Bill had this and Bill was kind enough to send me a, a photograph of it. And uh, this, just, this just, you know, um, I'm going to start drilling now. Hey, Brian. Uh, yeah. So, um, one of the things that truly makes that unique as well is that it's signed by Ansel Adams, mm -hmm. which is not something that is a very common thing to find. Uh, that's, that's what really makes it uh, so unique. 
Yeah, so if there is a, ever a fire on the Wilderness Ranch, I might like let all the keepsakes in my house burn down and just run down to Bill's place and make sure that this makes it out. So um, we'll see. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful print that really represents uh, you know, the title of one of his books, The Range of Light, because all the way from the shadows to the highlights, uh, the detail is there just, just incredible. Yeah. Just absolutely incredible. And if you want to know the real tearjerker to the whole thing is that I think my dad bought that uh, from the gallery in Yosemite from uh, Ansel Adams and at, had him sign it at the time. And I think he paid less than $10 for it. <laughs> wow. Okay. Bill, thanks for sharing that with us. Absolutely. That, is, uh, that is truly a treasure. I took my video off. Um. Alrighty, and so getting a little more into business, before we get into business, remember, uh, if you guys remember, we've been looking at this for three weeks, uh, for two weeks now, and this is our third week of looking at this. Um, this is the uh, photograph that was provided to me by Dave Fuji, and uh, it looks overexposed, but it is actually very well exposed. We would call the technique used here exposing to the right. And uh, where the sky looks like it's completely white, it is not. Um, if you look at the histogram, there is still space and there is no clipping between the right edge of this histogram and, uh, and uh, the edge of the screen. And that means, just very quickly, that uh, we can recover the highlights in that sky um, just by doing a few basic exposure adjustments. Um, and, uh, and we've been working with this photograph since. Um, as I explained to everybody, I tend towards black and white photo photography. So this is my interpretation of uh, Dave's photograph. And this is what we are working towards. Uh, we made some basic exposure adjustments to this in Lightroom last week. And then I opened up Photoshop and this is where the photograph is in Photoshop right now. And uh, so if we were to compare this sort of, if I can, um, side by side to that original photograph and in, uh, in Lightroom, um, you can see that uh, two big changes that we've made already is that we've managed to erase this sign in the corner. And uh, Rick Owensman, who I don't think is on tonight, uh, showed us how to do that. It does this magical thing called the, uh, the spot healing brush tool. Uh, that makes me think that um, uh, computers are about to take over the world, but that's a separate conversation. And uh, because it is, it is extraordinarily smart about how it just filled that in. And then we also took this pylon, and uh, one of the things we talked about was the composition of this photograph and how the pylon is a triangle that matches a couple of triangles up here uh, in the in the hills. And so I moved the Can pylon you want me to up. Get my earphones. I will. Okay, Kathy, are you okay? Oh, yes. Could you hear me? I could hear you. If you don't mind muting yourself, that would be that'd be great. I thought I was muted. No, Am you're muted? fine. Thank you. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay, I'm on it. We didn't hear any flushing toilets, so that's always good. <laughs> yeah, or or food, you know. If I push the we would have heard you chewing. That, that would have been awkward. So no, you're good. Um. The um, if you if you have troubles muting yourself, Kathy, I let me know because I can mute you. Um, I've got the power apparently. Um, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, apparently, I don't have the power. What the heck? Um, well, I won't. If you can figure, it, there you go. Now you're muted. Um, okay. Um, before, sorry guys, we're kind of moving along a little bit slowly before, but here, but before we move into this, um, Dave provided his own end result, which I think is really interesting. And if you look at um, uh, two really big things that Dave did here, um, that I, if, if I am seeing it correctly, um, actually there's a lot of stuff, Dave, that you did here. Um, you flattened out the background. You took this and you expanded it out and you took the trail and you wrapped, I'm not sure how you did this, 
Um, but you actually made the trail kind of an S curve going into, into the uh, uh, photograph. So here's kind of a before with a few, just a few exposure adjustments and here's an after. And before we dig in um, and get back to Photoshop, Dave asked me if uh, for a critique of this photograph. And uh, I would like to open it up for, for everybody um, for a critique as well. We've got most, or we've got a lot of Boise Camera Club members here and, and I would like to open it up for a critique of, of everybody. If I were to say what I think of it, um, the first thing is I really like, um, I was afraid to, to uh, expand this out to make the pylon larger. Um, I like the idea of having uh, the point of the pylon up, you know, near the apex that's created by this triangle right here. Um, but I was really afraid to make the pylon larger and I like how that was done. Um, I was also, when I do, was doing the post-processing, a little afraid to make the path more pronounced because I was having troubles with the cloning when I was doing that. Um, but um, I like the effect of this. I like the triangle on the bottom, kind of meeting with the triangle in the middle here. I like the orange, this is me offering a critique by the way. Um, I like the orange effect here and uh, the color in the clouds, kind of the little bit of purple in the clouds. Um, I, one of the things I would look for in a photograph like this is whether or not I can obviously tell that it's edited. And because I have been working on this photograph so much, it's like, I can kind of tell, but if I let myself sit back a little bit and, uh, and try to look at it with a fresh set of eyes, it's, it's not really that obvious. Uh, so I think it was really done. If there were two, or really well done, if there were two critiques I would offer, um, one is I would consider taking out this road right here um, because I do think this is a little bit of a distraction that doesn't necessarily need to be there. Um, also, this maybe feels a just the orange up here feels a little overbaked. And I wonder if that's uh, kind of a combination of the saturation of this um, next to the saturation of what's below it. Um, having worked with this photograph so much, I know the clouds uh, kind of looked like that, kind of didn't look like that. I really like the treatment of the clouds. I wouldn't change that at all. Um, the only other thing I would consider, no, I wouldn't really worry about it. Um, the only other thing I would consider as a critique maybe is maybe there's a little bit that could be done with these trees here. These trees are now smaller, whereas in the original, um, the trees were much larger. And I think that, I, I like that poppy yellow color. That's why we all went at the end of November to to Zion National Park. So I would wonder if there's, you know, as to get those fall colors, I was, I would wonder if there's something that you could do with these trees here uh, to bring those out. But that's, that's my critique. I think, I think this is a really well processed photograph. I, I think it, uh, I think of uh, warrants being printed and put on your wall, um, just all the way around. Well done. I am wondering if anybody else has any uh, feedback. Shane, I'm going to put you on the spot, man. You there? I'm here. Uh, what's I'm that? Here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, yeah. Yeah, so I I was blown away when you switched that over and showed uh, what Dave had done. Um, that uh, TP thing put right in the middle there just kind of grabs your eye and adds that element that you, you almost wouldn't expect to see. And then the sky is just very, very neat. I think maybe if, if I had any suggestion at all, it would be the left and the right sides, maybe doing a little bit of a vignette to just darken it down. The grass, particularly on the left, is kind of bright, kind of competing a little bit with entry into the photo, that I would maybe tone at least a portion of that down. But man, I really think that uh, that is a fantastic application of edit. Uh, that was really good job, Dave. 
so you're talking about doing a vignette and also bringing down kind of the heat on the grass on the in the lower left hand corner and so fortunately with Lightroom that's something that we can do really quick and uh, so I just went down here to the effects and I dragged out a little bit of a vignette and uh, and then I also used uh, a graduated density a graduated filter to darken this corner just a little bit more and um, so if you use the back splat backslash and click backslash you can see before and then click it again and you can see after and uh, so these are the edits that you're suggesting Shane which I think do help it a little bit um, Dave you're here what do you think Oh, I, I, that's a really, really good suggestion. Yeah, all the comments are really good. I, I am, so I really appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> so, so full, full disclosure, I didn't mean to suggest that this is an edit of the original photo. Um, this is earlier in the, in the morning. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> yeah, so you're, you're probably scratching your head thinking, how the heck did he do that? Yeah. Well, I, I got really close. That that uh, bonfire pile is is just uh, maybe a couple feet from me, and so and I'm using a really an ultra wide angle lens, uh -huh. and so so that's how I took this shot. Incidentally, uh, that morning. So so what happens is in in the back in back of you that. The sun is crusting um, another ridge of mountains, and it casts a shadow on this um, kind of orange front. And so, what you're seeing is, is, you know, the the full sun illuminating this amazing um, red rock, well, orange rock, by about a third on the top. And as it rises, as the sun rises. It continues to illuminate this rock, but the red doesn't, or the orange is less pronounced because of the angle of the sun. So that's what's happening there. Um, Brian was on his belly. I think he's <laughs> on his belly just to the right of me by about 50 feet. Yeah. So he's got a he's got a totally different shot of this, but probably during the same same. Um, same uh, hour of the day because we were shooting continuously all morning. Yep. Yeah, I'm not going to show you guys mine because it's not nearly as good as yours. So <laughs> uh, I bet it's great. Yeah, I I was I didn't have very good foreground interest in my shot. Um, and the thing to say about that is there are on, only so many fire pylons when you're shooting a scene like this, and Dave took them all up. So um, the uh, well, that makes all kinds of sense, Dave, uh, based on what you described, because you can kind of tell that this is taken with a uh, longer focal length uh, because the background is not as squashed. I was kind of thinking that I, I thought you took the same photograph and you did some really serious Photoshop magic and you basically barrel distorted the background here um, and really pinched it down uh in order to make it look like that but if you were using a very wide angle lens well that makes all the sense in the world uh how you were able to get this shot as compared to as compared to this shot here uh, yeah if you open up lens correction over mm -hmm. on the right hand side you'll probably see what my focal length was show, but i wonder if so your focal length was 11 millimeters that's that's right that's 11 millimeters on a crop frame so okay it's so really wide approximately 17 or 18 millimeters on a full frame yeah something like yeah. that yeah and you you did f11 were you did you focus stack it or would, did you just do f11 straight up no f11 straight up okay all right um, focus stacking probably would have helped actually yeah so, and what I mean by focus stacking, most of the time, if if I am shooting a scene like this, I'll usually shoot as narrow as I can. So F22 is what my lens would do. 
Um, but the problem with F22 is that then you have to really bump up your exposure time. So there's always that trade-off. And if there's a little bit of wind, uh, when you're bumping up that uh, exposure time, then you're going to see blurry um, uh, foliage in the foreground. The background will be sharper, but you'll see blurry in the foreground. If you've got wind and you just can't ex uh, afford to open up your shutter for three seconds, for example, and you want your background to be perfectly sharp, which this isn't bad, Dave, um, the, uh, then what you can do is you can basically focus on the foreground in one shot, focus on the background in another shot, and uh, compose the two together in Photoshop. That's, that is a rudimentary form of focus stacking. And, um, and then the, uh, you're basically digitally creating that depth of field at that point. Um, all right, we are 30 minutes in and uh, we've been kind of talking shop. My apologies, let's get to the main event. Um, if anybody has any more questions or any more discussion about this uh, and um, you know, maybe the difference between focal lengths and what effect focal lengths has and that kind of thing, please interrupt me. Um, but otherwise I'm gonna move on to Photoshop and uh, continue beating my head against the wall. Um, so if you guys, that's what I feel like when I'm working in Photoshop, it's always guess and check. It's always, you know, uh, how I hope this is going to have the effect I'm looking for. Um, Rick is not on the call this week, but one of the things we kind of danced around last week is what's called, uh, what I call non-destructive editing. Um, I always start with uh, the picture in the background that I'm working with. And, uh, and in Photoshop, you have layers. I can't, can't really get into the detail of, detail of what a layer is. That would just take forever in terms of conversation. However, layers are really well documented in Photoshop. And um, what I like to do is I like to start with, you know, when I open a photo in Photoshop, it goes into this background layer right here. And, um, and I never touch the background layer. I never do any edits to the background layer. I always layer my edits on top of the background layer. One of the things Rick was saying last week was that he always takes the background layer and immediately makes a copy of it. So that he's got the original image and then the next image on top of that. And I basically, I, I don't quite do that because it doubles the size of the image file. I just, for my part, make a conscious effort not to, to edit the background file. And then the very first thing I do as well after bringing in the photograph into Photoshop is I create a layer folder called edits and I put all of my edits in this folder and uh, as layers in this folder. And what this allows me to do among other things is by turning on and off that, that layer, um, I can come in here and say, okay, um, show me all the edits I've made versus showing me all the edits I haven't made. And uh, you can see two very clear edits that we've made is uh, basically getting rid of the sign here in the corner. And uh, also um, I made a copy of this pylon here and I moved the pylon up so that, um, you know, so that the apex of it is more matching the V here in the middle, much like, uh, much like um, um, what was in Dave's shot that he wanted us to, to look at today. Um, again, where we are going is something like this photograph right here. Uh, um, so I'm going to show you guys how I would process the photograph into black and white. Um, but uh, same disclaimer I made last week. Um, every time you do editing in Photoshop and Lightroom, it is a journey. It's kind of, I'm not a painter, but I imagine the process is a lot like painting and you're gonna get different results every time. And so I, I don't wanna say we will get exactly this result here, um, but um, we will get some result, you know, something like it. Um, maybe if somebody's got a great idea they wanna share, we'll, uh, uh, um, uh, we'll get something better. And so we'll, let's go from there. Um, I have this layer called cloning. Uh, cloning is using the clone stamp tool. This, uh, uh, this tool right here uh, to basically copy one section of a photograph to another. And um, so what I would like to do now, um, 
uh, Dave talked about having the path kind of kind of wrap around the pylon a little bit. Uh, he did it the easy way by composing a shot that way. Um, left it to me to do it the hard way, which is it digitally. And uh, I'll do this as best as I can. Um, again, you guys can, this is why I have my, uh, my camera mounted sideways. So if you look at the camera, you can see I'm using my uh, pen tablet and my, and my pen in order to do all of the brushwork on this. And so with the clone tool, you hit the Alt key and that gives you a crosshairs. And then you select the area of the photograph that you want to, that's not right. You select the photograph area of the photograph, click on the area of the photograph that you want to copy, and then start copying it in where you want it to go. Um, this is still very much a manual process, but it is one of the most magical um, parts of Photoshop I think that there is, um, is this clone tool. Um, you can just see one of the one of the things I'm doing is um, I keep clicking and selecting and grabbing a different area each time, and um, and that kind of mixes up where I'm copying into, so it doesn't look exactly like the source. Um, Dave, you're here, so uh, I can take out this brush here. I can take out some of these brushes here. Um, if it was me, I would be inclined to leave them. Now, the reason I took them out the first time was because you wanted the path more pronounced. I'm, I'm curious your feedback and what your preferences are on this. That's a really good question. So on my, on my uh, final photo, um, the one that we critiqued, yeah, uh -huh. I made that path pretty, pretty trampled down, right? Mm -hmm. So almost like, uh, well, like there's a lot of traffic and, and uh, that, that was kind of my vision of how it should be, but it wasn't like that at all, so. All right, well, let's go ahead and give it a try. Um, but you guys are gonna see either the limits of the clone tool or the limits of my editing ability or both. Um, because I did try it uh, before um, but it wound up kind of being patterny. I didn't really like too much the results I got. One of the things you guys noticed that I'm trying to do as I'm, uh, the first thing is I started grabbing something here and painting over here and realized that doesn't work because this is closer than the path over here and this looks big and it shouldn't. So if I'm wanting to clone sections over here, I need to clone ground that's closer to it so that uh, it has kind of the same um, scale, so to speak. Um, and this is the problem I run into with the clone tool is that then you start to see kind of these patterns emerge. And uh, I struggle with how to kind of get rid of those patterns. I just took the, uh, control Z key because I didn't like the result I got. Um, one of the things I might try doing is, because uh, I'm not sure how to get rid of this pattern up here, I just don't have enough to select, is actually, um, the hardness is already pretty low on my brush. So I'm gonna come up here and actually take the opacity down a little bit so that I'm not copying, uh, the exact rocks here, but I'm kind of copying the texture of the rocks. And I'm gonna use that to fill this in. And that gives me a little more of the effect I'm looking for. Um, one of the things that just did though, was it uh, softened up this edge right along here. And so I would wonder if there's anything I could do to kind of harden that up. Uh, Brian, one suggestion or one of the things that I do sometimes is I'll copy an area like the area in the foreground. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll select a area or, you know, like the, the ground in, in the foreground, uh, copy that or uh, paste that in as another layer mm -hmm. behind the, uh, the photograph that's in the front, uh, turn on the layer mask, and I'll change the scale of what I copied so that it matches or makes it look farther away. And then I'll use the brush tool to uh, selectively 
show pieces through the front layer uh, of the ground that I want. Uh, so that's another way that you can do it. Yeah, Russell, that is brilliant. Uh, Laura was just telling me that folks are having a hard time hearing me. Are you guys hearing me okay or do I need to do something different? I can hear you fine. Okay. No, the audio is very low, it's quiet. What's that? What's that, Daniel? Okay. Um, so I'm really curious to do what Russell just suggested because I think it's brilliant. Um, let's go ahead and bring this back in. All I'm doing is using the erasing tool on what I just did. And uh, so Russell, what you're suggesting is that I, if I'm understanding correctly, is that I basically take a copy of this. Yeah. I might not do a very good job of it, but I copy that. Um, I want to use copy merged. And uh, that I paste this in as another layer. Yeah, and put it behind your uh, photograph that's in the front. Okay. And, uh, and then, uh, the, uh, the photograph that's in the front, uh, use your uh, layer mask. Yeah, and because I'm doing the... Yeah, you have the background. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, that, and I do what Rick does, so I, I'll leave the background alone and I'll make a copy of the yeah. photograph so that I can move it to the foreground. I would wonder if what we could do is but if you uh yeah your uh, tool that you have selected right now you can change the scale of this uh so when it's behind it will appear smaller and you can uh, use your brush tool to uh um, make the pieces show up that you want to show up brilliant brilliant i'm wondering if what we can do is we can do this uh, and then basically uh, put a mask, whoops, My computer just froze for a second, put a mask on this. And, and uh, another thing that you can do so that it doesn't look like, you know, kind of a repeating pattern uh, that, you know, that you've copied from somewhere else is you can rotate it so um, that it will, kind of change the appearance of it a little bit. Maybe we'll do, well, but that kind of, that kind of messes with the shadows a smidge. How would you rotate this, Russell? Yeah, I think I'm gonna go ahead and try leaving it as is. And um, and then basically, instead of having, um, instead of the technique that, that uh, Russell was just talking about, about putting it behind, I'm going to try uh, painting in a, I'm going to try, I don't know how well this is going to work, but I'm going to try painting in a mask uh, on top of it. Um, in order to bring it in. Yeah. Okay. No, you're fine. All right, sorry, uh, Laura was downstairs where um, somebody got kicked out and they had to be let back in again, so we're letting them back in. Um, yeah, welcome to welcome to Zoom, folks. Thanks for your patience. Um, great. I'm going to go ahead and move on the way I was doing this. Russell, I kind of want to, I'm going to say that uh, your ideas are 
your your feedback is brilliant. I hadn't ever thought of that. Um, uh, I just need to kind of play with it a little bit before I, I try it again. It, uh, I'm not good enough to uh, do this on the fly, unfortunately. Uh, So that is not the best, but it's not bad either. Um, if you turn off the edits, here's what we had before, here's what we have now. Um, I still kind of want to take out this plant here. Um, so I would be inclined to try Russell's technique again. Uh, Russell, I'm really sorry if I'm mangling your technique. No, no, it's okay. It's uh the uh, sometimes you have to play around with it a little bit to get your yeah. you know, get the effect that you're looking at. It takes time. I, I sometimes I'll end up with you know like five or six different layers in the background, and I'll uh, like selectively ch uh, use the layer mask on each one of them to get the little pieces to show through that I want. Yeah, uh, totally yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it it takes some work for sure. <laughs> yeah. I just want to soften up this edge right here is what I'm trying to do. And uh, otherwise, I think, I think it looks all right. Um, I'm not a fan of, I'm going to zoom in on this. I'm not a fan of this soft edge we've got going on right here. So I think I'm going to make my stamp tool a little smaller and As if on cue, my computer is freezing every once in a while, um, just to spite me. And try to make that a little harder of an edge. This is definitely one of those, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. This is definitely one of those things I would wanna play with. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. Um, save often. So I just hit Control S to save this. And uh, usually at about this point, um, I will do what I would call a global curves adjustment. Once I have made kind of the pixel level edits that I want to make in a photograph, um, I'll create a new layer and I don't know how it works, but there's this key combination that's control shift alt E that copies all of the merged layers into one layer. And uh, then I will make a global uh, curves adjustment on this. Um, again, me tinting towards black and white, what I like to do is just go to clear curves and then options. And there's kind of some preset options here. And I usually go with the, uh, usually go with the presets. And uh, what I will try is either monochrome contrast or enhanced brightness and contrast. Um, usually if I'm going black and white, I have pretty good luck with saying enhanced monochrome contrast. And so this is my global curves adjustment here. And uh, like I said, I, last week I usually label my, my uh, um, edit, or I usually label my layers like that. And then if I am going to black and white with a photograph, it's usually at this point that I'll go ahead and punch it into black and white. And what I like, the way I like to do that is by um, putting a black and white layer above the edits layer. Um, it is an edit, maybe it should go in the edit folder, I usually don't. And I would call this my black and white master. And uh, so this obviously converts the entire image to black and white. Um, one of the really interesting things about this is that you can basically uh, select within the black and white image the luminosity or the brightness of a particular color. 
And uh, when I am doing this in Photoshop, I always mess with each of these sliders just to see what kind of interesting effect I can get. So if I bring the red down, you can see how that gives me some interesting context, contrast in the background. So I'm gonna bring the red down a bit. And then I wanna see what bringing up and down the yellows does. Um, the yellows actually bringing it up kind of maybe emphasizes some of the highlighting here, although now it looks really flat. I don't have uh, kind of the highlight here and the, and the darkness here. Um, that worries me a little bit, but my question is, can we make, up, make that up with burning and dodging later on, which I will probably try to do. Uh, greens, um, I usually like to boost the greens a bit if I can uh, to kind of get an infrared effect. Um, and uh, infrared is usually the, if something is organic or foliage, it shows up bright white on it bright white on an infrared photograph. Um, kind of a kind of an aside, a pointless aside that I'm really excited about is I, right before coronavirus hit, I upgraded my camera. I bought a Canon 5DS, which is a 50 megapixel full frame. It's a it's a it's like a 5D Mark III, except it's a 50 megapixel full frame version of a 5D Mark III. So really, really nice landscape photography camera. And I had a 5D Mark II, which is a 20 megapixel full frame. And uh, 5D Mark IIs are getting really cheap now. You can buy one used for 500 bucks and it's like it's worth more than $500 to me as a backup camera. And then I had the brilliant idea to have it converted to infrared. So I now have uh, my 5D Mark II, which I can shoot infrared with. Um, really, really excited about that. So um, maybe, if this session keeps going and people keep coming, maybe one of these days, one of these Sundays we'll produce, we'll uh, deal with one of my infrared photographs. Um, cyans, let's see, there's not a whole lot of cyan in this photograph, so I'm not gonna worry about that too much. There's definitely some blue in the sky. Uh, I think I'm gonna bring down the blues and maybe the cyans in case there's some tapering, um, just so I can get a little more depth out of the sky here. And uh, magentas, I don't think there's a whole lot of, it's pretty rare on a landscape photograph like this that you're gonna have some magentas in it. Maybe a sunset shot you would. Um, but you can see where uh, uh, kind of in the background, this is affecting it a little bit, but not much. So I'll probably go ahead and leave that as is. Um, so like I said, whenever I'm converting to black and white, I always mess with these just to get you know some interesting contrast in there and so forth. Um, so here's the black and white conversion. Now there is still a lot of work that can be done on this photograph uh, in terms of bringing out um, detail in the photograph. The first thing I wanna start working on, I think the sky is still very underexposed. And so um, the first thing I wanna start working on is actually uh, using a curves layer on the sky. Now curves is kind of like layers as, uh, as a topic. It, um, you know, we could, we could spend hours talking about curves and how curves work, unfortunately. Um, but suffice it to say, if the further you, maybe just a kind of a quick introduction to curves, you can see where my mouse pointer is on the left here. If I, the closer you are to the left of the curves window, the more you're dealing with shadows. So if I want to boost shadows, I click towards the left and move it up. And whoa, there went all my shadows. Um, there went drastically in my shadows. Or if I want to move my shadows down, I pull it down. And uh, so the um, um, this is how I work with shadows is by grabbing the right hand or the left hand side of the curves. If I want to do highlights, I move more towards the right of the curves box. And you can see how that, uh, that affects the highlights in the image. Um, the key thing to curves is realizing that the steeper line is, so I can grab two control points on this and basically um, pull the two control points so that the highlights, the highlight highlights are kind of kind of squished together. The shadow shadows are kind of squished together. And in between the shadows and the highlights are kind of stretched out. Do you see what just happened to the contrast on this image? So I'm gonna turn this off, that's a little flat. I'm gonna turn it back on again. Uh, it's not flat anymore, it's not right. Uh, 
it was way more contrasty than it is, than it was. Um, the thing, the key thing about working with curves is shadows to the left, highlights to the right, the steeper the line is, the uh, more contrast you've got. You can do some pretty crazy stuff like making the line reversed. And uh, as you research curves, this is where kind of, you, you can see how now it looks like it's, um, it's um, a uh, negative. And that's exactly what I just did with the tones by reversing the curve is make them negative. So um, anyway, I work a lot with curves and curves are kind of a, uh, kind of an art form. And um, just, you gotta play around with them. I recommend researching them. Um, but it's, uh, it's a lot of how I get the contrast out of my image. Now looking at the sky, um, so I created this curves, uh, I just reset it back to a normal flat line. What I wanna use this curve panel to do is to get more out of the, more detail out of the sky. Um, you can click on this uh, little guy here and start, it makes an eyedropper on your image and your eyedropper is uh, represents where you can see as I, m I move about the image how there's this little control point, potential control point moves about the, the curve over here. And uh, what this allows me to do is say, okay, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find the darkest area in here that I can. I think this is probably about as dark as it gets. And what I wanna do in the sky is I wanna introduce more contrast between the bright areas on the sky and the dark areas in the sky. So my bright areas in the sky are already selected. That's the upper, that's the upper corner here. The dark areas I just selected with my eyedropper. And so I'm gonna go grab this control point I just added to the curve and start bringing this down. And you can kind of see where that starts giving more more contrast in the sky. Ignore the rest of the image for now. Um, we're gonna fix that real quick, but at how it gives me more contrast in the sky, that's exactly what I'm going for. Um, like I said, it kind of ruined the rest of the image, but this is where masks uh, become such a great deal. I've got my mask on selected right now. Um, I've got black and white. Uh, uh, black is my uh, foreground color over here. I'm gonna grab, I just selected my brush. And uh, what the mask does is uh, anywhere in the photograph uh, where the mask is black, it, uh, it uh, um, basically turns off that adjustment. It turns off that curve. And anywhere in the photograph where the mask is white, um, it allows it through. So I'm using the mask, I'm able to come in here and that adjustment that I just made on the sky, I'm able to then take my brush. And uh, this is why I like using the, the, the brush palette so much is because it feels natural uh, to me. And uh, I'm able to come in here and um, basically, uh, what just happened to my brush? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, sometimes things get kind of out of sync with each other. I'm able to come down here and essentially turn off that curve effect for the rest of the image um, just by filling it in with the, with the brush like this. And uh, so now um, you can see what I don't want and you have to be really careful about when you, when you turn on something that strong is some haloing in the sky. Um, if we had more time, I would probably paint that in more carefully so that we've got less haloing. Um, and by haloing, I mean, you can kind of see a little bit of haloing here where it starts to lighten up before it hits the right, the, the rock face. Um, <sighs> darn it, we are at eight o'clock already. So hopefully if you guys want to come back next week, we will finish this photograph and we will spend an entire month working on a photograph. Um, but hopefully it's worth your time as well. Um, because, you know, like I said, I'm just kind of talking you through what I do and showing you what I do. And uh, and then, you know, Russ, thanks for so much. Hopefully, is it Russ or Russell or it doesn't matter? Uh, Russ is fine, yep. Russ, Russ sorry. <laughs> okay, um, thanks so much for your tip. And uh, um, I really like it when I learn something. 
And like I said, we'll come back to this next week and hopefully uh, hopefully finish it up and then be able to move on to something else. Um, we've, it's just a little bit before eight o'clock. Do we have any uh, questions, comments before we wrap up for the week? Okay, um, hearing none, then uh, let's uh, sign off. And uh, like I said, it would be quite the honor if you came next week. I don't blame you for not coming, but it would be quite the honor if you did. It's quite the honor for you guys to join me tonight. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for setting it up. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Good, good, good. Hey, Brian, are you still there? I am still here, Bill. Um, is it, I tried to just th threw it into the chat and it didn't uh, go over real quick, but can you briefly explain hardness or do you just want to maybe save that for, uh, uh, I see when you're adjusting this, the hardness levels on that. Uh, do you want to save that for a future? Or well, is um, like I've been doing as, as I get questions throughout the week, I answer the questions. I can look at you. Um, I answer the questions uh, throughout the week. Uh, so if you don't, if uh, if you're able to log in next week, uh, uh, remind me and we'll we'll talk about that right at the very beginning. Um, if you're not able to log in next week, um, hopefully I'll remember and you can watch the recording. Okay, that sounds yeah. great. Thank you. Um, but the quick answer is hardness. Um, it uh, it has to do with the edges of the brush and uh, how how hard the edges of the brush are. And uh, when you're trying to make things kind of blend together, you want as little hardness as you can. Uh, yeah, and I usually, the edges. What's that? It feathers the edges. It feathers the edges, that's right. Okay. okay. Nice glass of wine there, Shane. Yeah, going, yeah Shane. I was telling everybody last week how if I'm, if I'm not presenting to everybody and therefore, uh, um, you know, uh, being coherent is not a problem. I usually drink whiskey and do light room, so <laughs> that's my mo. So no, that, that the hardness explanation makes perfect sense. I've used uh, both uh, those things in uh, Photoshop before, and so I didn't realize that you could adjust that. So now it gives me something to play with. Yeah. So if you're on next week, please please remind me, and I'll just show you guys real quick how you adjust the adjustment uh, hardness and size of the brush. Cool. Cool. Thank you very much. All right. All right. We'll Take see care, you next Bill. time. Harold, you doing okay? Doing fine. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for logging on. And thanks again for broadcasting this to the club. Sure. I was like a lot of club folks on. So Good. Thank yeah. you for your efforts. Oh, absolutely. I guess this is my pleasure. So. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah. Take care. Shane, you got anything? No, buddy. I just, uh, I'm just really happy you're doing this. This is, this is great. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Um, as I told Harold, I'm going to do it as long as people keep coming. Um, we finished this photograph. We'll do another one. Perfect. Yeah. That's my hey, Brian, I got a question for you. Yeah. Who is this? This is Dave? Yeah. This is Dave. Yeah. So, so I, I have always loved your black and white photos and, uh, I, I kind of had, especially with this photo, I've struggled with it, with trying to do a black and white. And uh, I don't really know how to ask the question intelligently, so I'm just gonna try to kind of blurt it out. Um, so, um, so, you know, color photos, among other things, they, they're, they, they provide a lot of differentiation with you, right? Mm -hmm. and when you take that differentiation away, then, then uh, all of a sudden, my my photos, things that I want to to stand out don't stand out because they're no longer color color channels to uh, to create that district or that differentiation. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, well, let's see. The specific problem that I had was I was trying to create that path and the path kind of blended in with everything else because it was 
black and white. So there, there's some philosophy that you probably have to create differentiation in the absence of color. And I wanted to get your kind of strategy to do that. Contrast, burning, and dodging. Um, those are the tools you have available to you so far as I know. Um, and hopefully that's a legitimate answer to your question. Um, but the answer is, I believe the way it tends to work is the eye is drawn towards contrast, it's drawn away from contrast. And so I will bump out the contrast of something to try to pull the eye towards it. And then you can also use burning and dodging. It tends to be, the eye tends to be, follow brighter areas more than it follows um, darker areas. And, um, and so that is what, that is my philosophy is I use contrast to draw the eye. I also use darkening and lightening to draw the eye in black and white. So and, I, was guessing um, that, I was guessing that you probably used those color channels to create contrast where, well, for instance, you know, two colors of the same magnitude, and you take the color away, they look the same. Mm -hmm. I was guessing that you probably played with those color channels quite a bit to create differentiation between two colors when you remove hue. I do. That's one of the techniques as well, but I, yeah, if you, let me share my screen again. Um, it's like what we were talking about how when I started working with the color channels, um, it took away the layer here on this image. Um, I was jumping ahead a little bit, but I, if I were to come back and look at this image, is it in Lightroom? Here it is. Now, for um, some reason, I, I don't see your screen. I see you. Okay. I did just try to share it. Um, if it's okay, let's get to this next week. And that sounds, that sounds uh, what good. I always what I always do is it's it uh, this is where I when it comes to black and white photography I feel like I'm um, I feel kind of like I'm the Swedish chef you know that I'm do -do 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 and making a mess of everything and uh, but somehow it works and uh, and so I'll do my kind of pixel level edits and my um, kind of exposure edits in Lightroom or in Photoshop which is what we're doing right now. So essentially I'll do the cloning and the curves in Photoshop and then I'll bring it back into Lightroom and it'll still look really flat in Lightroom. And, uh, and then I start really kind of doing kind of meta tweaks to the photograph um, in terms of the toning. And that's how I draw it in and get it to the point where, it, where I want it. And, it. and it works with the eye the way I want it to. And uh, hopefully we'll do that do. next week. Uh, in conjunction with the uh, uh, the uh, channels in the black and white layer, is uh, you can also add uh, color layers uh, or gradient layers uh, underneath that black and white layer. So, like if your if your photo lacks like red in the background, you can add a gradient layer with red at the top and maybe green at the bottom, and then you can use that ch uh, channels in the black and white layer to bring those out more. Uh, by adding a color layer underneath it. I'm still oh, still trying to figure that, out what And change your blending show. mode to uh, like over uh, overlay or um, um, uh, soft light and that uh, that will uh, uh, like kind of blend the, uh, blend those colors in with the original photograph and then you uh, when you start adjusting channels in in your black and white layer you can make one or uh, uh, you know, like one or more colors, a little more pronounced than it usually is in the photo. That's a nice trick. Yeah, Thanks. Russ, how do you feel about doing this next week? I'll just make <laughs> it the whole. I can and... jump. Yeah, I can jump in and try uh, try doing some uh, uh, some of those because I I know when I convert to black and white, I use the same technique that you do uh, with that black and white layer. But uh, like if I have certain. Uh, spots in the picture like this one has a lot of red in the background but not much green or yellow in the front uh -huh. so what you can do is add a gradient layer that has like green or yellow 
uh, uh, as the gradient, keep it towards the middle to the bottom of the photograph. And then in your channels on your uh, black and white layer, you can bring those up more. Yeah, interesting. And then when you convert it to black and white, those are, uh, since there's more green than there was in the original photograph, when you blend that uh, layer in, uh, it will show up with more contrast. That is a brilliant idea. I'm going to have to try it. Uh, Russ, I'm going to give you a 10% raise. You earned it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for the feedback. That is, those are some awesome ideas. Yep. You bet. All right. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. It's getting close to Tristan's bedtime. So okay. y'all have a very nice evening. Thanks yep, for joining me. Thank you. All right. Take care.